Hello, so I'm going to walk you through Rhythmorphic. Um, so Rhythmorphic is a Max for Live MIDI effect. Um, it's a sequencer, so if I run Live's Transport, we'll hear it sending out a little sequence of notes to this synthesizer. And um, so Rhythmorphic is, at its core, it's using a type of Euclidean sequencer, but it's it's differing from a Euclidean sequencer because I use a image source to to kind of morph um, the sequence, and then you can get non-Euclidean rhythms with it because there's a lot of Euclidean sequencers out there, so um, we don't need another. And this is a a not getting non-Euclidean rhythms um, is the goal, but you can use it like a Euclidean sequencer too if you'd like. Um, and you can kind of morph between them. So let me show you what the, what that is, the, it, how that works. So if I, it, there's this parameter morph, um, which says how much the image kind of changes the sequence. And so if I turn morph all the way down, we just get a Euclidean sequence. And that's represented with this line going from the beginning to the end. And um, and as it goes from the beginning to the end, there's little hits, these little hits. And so right now it's behaving like a Euclidean sequencer. You give it a number of steps. You give it a number of hits. Right now it's five. And so it's five and nine steps. Now five, uh, seven and, I can turn it back down to five. So five and 13 steps now. Yeah, and then, so that's just like a Euclidean sequencer, but then how this differs is, so there's this image behind, so you have this line, and it really doesn't mean too much when it's Euclidean sequence. It's just the changes of values. If you quantize the line, distribute the hits. Now, you also have the line here, and moving around doesn't really do much, and you have this image, but if you turn morph up, you'll see the line is morphing, it's bending, and now, depending on the curvature of basically the brightness of the image behind where the line is, almost have as if this is like a, a landscape with um, height. Um, anyway, that, that morph, my, how that curves the line changes the hits and the accents um, based on the curvature. So then you get n not, not Euclidean rhythms. You don't get Euclidean rhythms with this. I mean, you can if you got the background right, but you know that's not the idea here. So then, if you change the image, you're changing the curvature. If you change the position of the line, um, you also get to change the rhythm. That all changes the rhythm, and and so yeah. So now I have su two sequencers running, and you have up to four. Um, right, so that's the main idea. You have this like image changing, can change the image in different ways. Um, and then you can modulate all this stuff with a little LFO section. And so I'll get into all that here. I'm kind of jumping around, but I'm going to go through everything. But I just want to present to you the main topic. Uh, the main uh, concept. So that's kind of how this works. Uh, image changing rhythms. And um, and, and getting non-Euclidean rhythms out of it. And then there's just like a bunch of stuff you can do within all that. So I'll go from, through it left to right. Um, so the first thing we see is on this left side. And so here at the top is kind of like just running the whole thing. So if it has to, it only runs when lives transport's running, so I'm now I'm running lives transport. But then if I turn this button off, that turns it on and off. And then this sets like the rate, the interval between the steps. So if I if I let's turn this back to Euclidean sequence, and I'll give it all the steps. So there's a hit on every step. Now we we can hear it's kind of running at its 16th notes at 120 BPM. And then, um, so if I go to eighth notes, so this changes like the global rate. 
But then individually you can change things about that with the sequencer. But this is the global rate. Anyway, um, let me... um, so, okay. Now we have the resync section. So when you like add a sequencer and like maybe changing things about its steps and all sorts of other stuff, its rate, its direction, you know, it, it can still, s it'll be in a different phase, like a different position than if I stopped and started again and they'll be different now. And so this is like them in phase and when you're changing the steps and stuff, they'll get kind of out of sync. And so if they're out of sync and you want to resync them, um, you just press this resync button. And this resync button will basically restart the sequences at the next quantized interval that you set here. So right now, by default, it's at one bar. But if you want it bigger or lower, you can have it resync at the next two bar mark, four bar mark, whatever. And then here, auto resync, if you have that on, which it is by default, then it will automatically resync every time any sequencer is like turned on and off, um, change or change anything basically that would send it out of sync, change the direction, stuff like that. So that will, when auto mode's on, all those changes will cause it to resync at the next quantized interval. And so um, usually that's useful, but sometimes you might not want that to happen, especially if you're modulating stuff. You might not want that on, or you might want it to only resync like every big bar if you're modulating stuff. That depends on how you're doing that. Anyway, so it's good to kind of understand how this works a little. Okay, then below that is the section for like determining what this image in the background is from. So right now, by default, it's on this kind of texture mode where you have these different um, textures or even just like, yeah, like you have transfer functions here. And that's for like more like simple curves, some of these categories. And some of them are better for more complex things. So anyway, you can just basically go through these categories and uh, see what's kind of cool. This one's cool. And then, um, yeah, and, and, um, and then the kind of quality of the image makes a big difference, you know, um, for how, how busy the pattern will be and things like that. Or, you know, you can kind of make the pattern really long over a long length and, and play it slower. And you'd get maybe more, oh, see, long-term kind of pattern change. Anyway, you can play around with a lot of stuff. And the image makes a big difference in that. Um, okay, so... Yeah, then when you choose... Okay, then the other type of source is one where you can drop in image or video files. Um, or you can turn on the camera mode. And here I am. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not making a very good sequence, although the density is very low. All right, there we go. Uh, anyway, you'd have to kind of figure out how to make that nice, but there's a lot of things you could do. You can also just drop in a image or video file. Um, I don't really have one prepared. You can just use. Um, okay, yeah. So you can you can drop in. Um, I don't know what this one is. Image. Okay. And there's an image I dropped in, and there you can drop in a video file. Yeah, okay, and then for each source, you have some parameters down here. So for video, you have the start of the video, you have the length it plays for. It's just doing like a loop. Um, and then you have the speed of the video. Okay, and then... Um, if I dropped in an image, like the one before, um, it becomes zoom, and you can offset the X and the Y. And then if it's a texture, you also have like a s scale, and you can offset 
uh, the X and the Y. Um, anyway, so that's this whole section, basically. And um, all this stuff is modulatable. Um, so then we have the section of the sequencers. So you have four sequencers. There are these different colors. Only one of them's been on, or one or two, this whole time. And so it's the blue sequencer here. Um, you can turn that one off, too, or on. Um, you can randomize the parameters. I won't do it right now because it could get crazy, but it, it can be fun. Uh, you, you know, it's it's first starting to find stuff. Although sometimes you stumble upon cool things. But there's a lot of parameters. Um, anyway, you can change the number of steps in the sequence here. Um, okay, then so mag. Okay, so before I get to mag, I want to get to density. And that's what the other thing we've been playing with. This sets like, if it was a Euclidean sequencer, this would be like number of hits. But because the morphing's more complicated than that, it's just the density. So if I turn morph down and it's Euclidean sequencer now, this is just like relates to the number of hits. And we can see down here, here's the actual current number of hits with this density. Um, so six hits in 12 steps is even. Um, otherwise, let's go to 10. It's more fun. All right, so then I'll turn morph back up. And so now with the same density, there are more hits because that depends on the image. If the image has a lot of curves, there's a lot more hit hits. Um, so yeah, this is like a pretty curvy image. Anyway, so that density means something different. Now, yeah, regarding all that curviness, this brings us into mag. So mag, uh, let me try to explain it simply. So mag, well, what mag strives to do is like, you see right now with 10 steps, we don't get a lot of detail of this curve. So, you know, what mag strives to do is to get more detail of it. So if I go to two, what mag does is it doubles the number of steps, but if it also doubles the rate. And then, so that way, it maintains kind of the same timing of the whole sequence and the main hits. But now, it has more precision and in the curves. And so you can have more hits at a faster rate without disturbing the actual sequence. And then, um, if you actually wanted to go back to kind of the same rate, but have this magnitude, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. You could go down here to this rate and maybe half the speed and now you have like the same 16th note hits but you have a longer sequence I hope that makes kind of sense so let me go back up and then um, I'm gonna turn mag up even more and it'll double that again and then again and this is kind of the this is kind of the maximum um, you know it's pretty fast right now and so now I can turn down the hits too. Okay, now the other thing is, is this thing next to mag, and that's quant. And it doesn't just quantize the hits, because then there would be really no need for such a thing. You could change um, that in other ways. But um, what quant does, so well, let me turn it off. So right now it's just freely um, allowing the curvature to to control the hits. Sorry, I like the word I said. Okay, and, um, but that can, especially with like high magnitudes or anything like faster than 16th notes, that can lead to some awkward rhythms sometimes. Or maybe you really want that and you want this kind of very free thing so you can keep it off. But um, it might be awkward for some rhythms. So what quant does is help to like, maintain kind of the integrity of the rhythm that's happening but also make it like a lot smoother to a certain quantization so if i'm like at 128 notes still nothing's really happening it's not even going that fast 96 note but as 64 note it's starting to move and and so now here at 16th note that's 
the way I turn this rhythm into this. I'll turn it up more. Off. Yeah. So it's not like the most perfect thing, but um, it does sound a lot often more easy to go with other rhythms. Of course, you still have to dial some stuff in, but it actually helps a lot. Because when it's off, you can get a lot more awkward rhythms. But they can a lot of times be really cool rhythms with it off, too. Not to say that it's not good. But um, yeah, it just depends what you're doing, especially if you're modulating it. You know, you can't always dial in all these movements like you can if you move it. So sometimes the quant just helps keep things sound a bit cleaner. You can even go more extreme. It's like eighth notes, but you'll get a lot more groupings if you if you do that because there's just not a lot of depth in eighth note. Um, but yeah, just play around with it and you'll get slightly different rhythms. Um, okay, it's also a really big magnification right now. Anyway, I hope that section makes sense. It's a little uh, not, I, I don't know how obvious it is. Okay, so so that explains this whole top part. It's, it gets easier from here. Um, so you have just the X and Y of the line. Ooh, it's getting really windy behind me. The rotation of the line um, and the length of the line. And all those things you can also do with clicking here. So just clicking it and dragging changes the X and Y. And then if you hold Shift, you can also rotate it and change the length. Ro Changing length is left and right. Rotating it is up down. It's hard to do right now because I'm holding a microphone uh, in one of my hands. But uh, yeah, okay. And then um, okay. So then down here is about the actual playing back. So right now it's just going forward in the sequence. You can also have it go backward or forward and backward. Okay. Then. Uh, below that, you I touched on the rate a little bit. So this scales the rate um, of the rhythm. So if I go, I can go faster and faster. And right now the quantization is on, so it also will change this sequence depending on the rate um, because it's all related. Okay, and um, and then this little times two here. Um, if you turn that on, that just says it won't get all these little in-between values. It'll just go. It'll just round this, so it'll go from one to two to four. Um, so there's no like 1.5 or anything, and and it'll go likewise down to like half and quarter and and stuff like that. Um, powers of two, um, and so then you can offset the sequence. So and then the grid. Let me turn it to eighth because it's easier to understand the grid. So here, yeah, I, I, if I offset that, it just offsets the starting step, and we can see this little blue bar is the is the initial position. It's at zero. The blue bar is over here, and so we offset it, and we can see how that changes. It's hard. I mean, it it's hard to tell without other rhythms and stuff. But anyway, yeah, if you had like a drum rhythm, maybe you'd want the snare not to be on the one, so you'd offset it. And then this is the three and a two, so maybe you'd offset it if it's a snare or whatever. You know, you'd offset it for lots of reasons. Um, okay, so that's this section. Then this section deals all with the note that's being sent out to here. So you have, uh, let me turn this off. So you have the pitch of the note. And then uh, you can spray the pitch randomly. And, uh, and OK, so then let me turn that off. But you can choose this. Or I'll turn that back on, actually. So it's just spraying randomly. And then if you press this, you can see different scales. So right now the scales are off, but you can turn them on. Major pentatonic. You can change the tonic. Um, 
Okay, and then you can change the velocity here and spray the velocity too. And the duration here too. And you can spray the duration. Okay. Uh, now... Okay, so now... I'll, okay, I'll get to the modulation in a second. I'll just explain this real quick. So, you can do bursts here. And, um, actually, let me do, let me go to the modulation. Okay, so the modulation, yeah. So let me turn off the spray. And we instead we can modulate the note pitch with, say, an oscillator. So here's all the menus for the four sequencers. And here's the oscillator at the bottom uh, the modulators at the bottom and it's just two LFOs I didn't I didn't do sequencers and all that um, I kind of want to I, I know that's really typical with these kind of things but um, I don't know I kind of like the idea of just having to drive things through oscillators and um, you know I could change my ma mind later and add sequencers but I I'd, I'd, I really I don't know I felt like this was a device I didn't want to be like like there's a lot of Euclidean sequencers with step modulators out there and I, I wanted this to be a, not really used like like them to be a bit, a bit of its own thing um, so that said you have two LFOs with two destinations each and um, so let's change let's let's set the rate to a synchronized rate so we can make like a synchronized rhythm and then let's set the destination for it and here's all the destinations um, like here you have um, you have uh, the rate of <laughs> sorry the master rate um, I'll get the patterns later um, you can modulate different pattern snapshots uh, the text things about the image is and then you have the sequencer parameters and that just repeats for the four sequencers so we want to do sequencer one's note and then we'll add some amount and since they're synced you get just like a consistent like kind of melody even though some things are randomized here and we can slightly even spray from that So then you get, yeah, kind of uh, little variations of this main kind of melodic thing. Okay, and uh, and then let's say we wanted to like rotate it, I guess. Um, we can rotate it kind of with the same oscillator and add some amount, and that will change the sequence, uh, the, the pattern of the rhythm. Okay, now, um, okay, sorry. Um, so yeah, that's how the LFO section works. Let's go with that first. Then. Okay, so um, now we've kind of gone through all this a bit. Um, let's do these last couple of sections. So burst is like kind of adding uh, a little burst or roll of notes, uh, generally right before a quarter note hit. And um, let me show you that. So let me add like, let's do even a Euclidean rhythm to make it easier. A really simple Euclidean rhythm, just, I mean, just, you know, a pulsing, a pulse. Oh yeah, this is going backwards. Let me just turn this off. We can just focus in on it. Okay, so then we can do little bursts. This is the probability of a burst happening. Uh, oh yeah, and you have to activate it for a sequencer down here. Okay, let's turn the probability down. And 
let's turn the duration of the note down. So now it has a little burst of 16th notes. We can turn the length of that down here and turn the rate of that down. <laughs> yeah, and then you can also spray the rate a little bit or as much as you want. Yeah, so that adds a little first. So that's burst, and you can yeah activate for both of them, or none of them. And then, okay, I'll get the patterns in a second, it's the most in-depth, but then uh, bends here, similar to burst, bends like adds a little, like a chance of a, a pitch bend happening, and you can change the depth of that. So this is like the chance of a pitch bend happening, being like a, a little pitch envelope. And it, it, it just sends pitch bend signals. So that depends on how the synth interprets the pitch bend. But um, yeah, and then uh, this is the depth of the bend. This is the probability of it bend, bending up or bending down. And then this is the length of time of the bend. You can do a big bend. But do it not often. Okay, so the last thing is patterns. And so patterns um, allows you to store the current pattern and change it and modulate it or whatever. So patterns, um, you can save a pattern with the save button and it saves it into the selected um, index. So I just saved all what we're hearing now into index one. And then um, if I go to index two, we don't, there's nothing there, so nothing loads. Uh, if there was, something would load. So let's just change. Let's just change these rhythms. Okay, so this is a different rhythm. You can even add another sequencer. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just I'm just doing something really random. Um, okay, yeah, it doesn't sound that great, but anyway, um, I got. Okay, let's just do it like this. So this is another pattern, and let's save it in index two. So now, if I go back to index one it loads this pattern. And if I go to the next two, it loads that pattern. If you if you want if I want if you want to open like index one without loading the pattern, you can hold the alt option button. If you hold the alt option button and then go back to one. Oh oops, sorry I was wrong. Okay, now I'll hold the alt option button and then I'll go back to one. And now I'm back at one without changing the pattern. So the alt option lets you open a pattern without recalling it. Anyway, uh, if you want to like overwrite it or something. Okay, otherwise if you go to a blank pattern, nothing will happen. So yeah, now I have pattern one and two and I can even modulate between them. So if I go back to the LFO, I'll turn this to two bars. 
Um, I'll turn off the resync so I don't trigger resyncs from changing stuff. Um, or actually, I'll just set the resync to two bars so that if anything changes, it won't resync until the oscillator is done the phase anyway. That's what I usually do. Okay, so now that I'll just do a ramp wave. And so it just does a two bar ramp. And then I'll send that to pattern. And then I'll just go between the two patterns over two bars. So I'm at pattern one. And I'm going to go up to pattern two. And depending on the amount I do will change kind of the f timing of that. Yeah, so now I'm modulating between the patterns with this LFO. So you can do more complex things. Now, there's a whole nother thing you could do with this too. Which is, um, so let me stop modulating the pattern. And if you turn on this LFO button, that means that, so right now, when we change patterns, it doesn't change anything about the LFOs. Patterns are just the sequencers. But if you, tr if you press LFO, then it, when you save a pattern, it also includes the LFO data in the pattern. And that way you can also change a pattern and change the entire modulation of everything for very complex differences. But if you do that, then you can no longer, pattern no longer modulates um, because there would be a, a conflict there. So if you turn on LFO, you can't modulate patterns with an LFO. Um, but you can store all the modulations and map it to a knob or a controller and change very complex patterns with that. So let's do that. Um, I'll turn off this pattern modulator. And right now, I have the current modulation happening that we've been hearing. I'll turn on LFO, and I'll save all this to pattern 1. Then I'll open pattern 2, and now I'll change it. I'll change it so this thing's rotating, and now it's a much... maybe faster. Okay, yeah. And then I'll save this modulation in pattern 2. And now if I open pattern 1, you see the modulators are no longer spinning all crazy like that. And if I go to pattern 2, they are spinning crazy like that. So yeah, that with the LFO on, that allows you to do crazy things uh, with the patterns. I mean, I'm sorry, crazy things. It, it allows you to do more complex patterns, and then you could maybe use it for performance um, with a very more complex... If you had this as a beat, or because you can do this with drums, uh, I'll show you in a second. And then um, you, the last thing is this little dice, and that le lets you randomize um, all of the patterns, um, which I don't... I guess we can do it's just a bit crazy but uh, yeah this randomizes all of the sequence patterns sometimes you get cool ideas from it but it doesn't randomize the quantize or the scale um, so it maintains something about it um, yeah so that's all the parameters I just want to show you on drums um, so I'll leave that running and let's Let's throw another Rhythmorphic on this 909 kit. Okay. And for starters, I'll just change it to a Euclidean sequence just for on the floor. Um, and then, so then we're not hearing anything because you see it's sending out this C3 and it's hitting here on the drum. There's no drum. But what we can do is we can either go down to the kit. Let me turn that. We can either go down to the kit. I, I sorry, go down and pitch. You know, to get the kick you want, and that could work very well for what you're doing. Um, to have the control of the same pitch, but um, but I also gave you a scale option for drums, and in the drums scale option, 
now the pitches are are scaled to the drums. So if I go to C zero, C negative two, it will just do the lowest pitch on your drum rack, which is usually the kick. And if I did that again, say for this, let me turn this all the way down. And if I did that again for this yellow um, sequencer, or yellow orange, um, I'll turn the scale also to drums. And now you see if I change the pitch, it's not exact, it just it scales it to these pitches. So if you if you threw in a different drum rack with like a hundred pitches, it would scale all the pitches to that. So no matter what you choose, you're in the drum rack. Um what am I gonna say? Um yeah, so I can find the snare. And usually if somebody does the drum rack like this like this, you can you can um, find these default areas and it you can think that this sequencer will usually be a snare, etc. So now I have a snare and a and a kick and I can and I can get maybe offset the snare. send this to a hi-hat yeah um, there's just like a lot of things you could do